Welcome to Bar Chart's weekly series of webinars, offering you guidance and ways to better utilize Bar Chart's wide range of pages and tools in conjunction with today's diverse market strategies. Today's subject, Dogs of the Dow Year End Review. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about or we're going to re revisit a past webinar based on a hypothetical portfolio that we created using uh, the value investing strategy with uh, the 10 bottom blue chip stocks in the Dow 30 that also had the highest dividend yield. Now, we did this with the belief that these out of favor stocks uh, could outperform in the coming year. So, hello everyone. My name is John Rowland, Bar Charts Head of Trading Education, and joining us today is my partner and our moderator, uh, Bar Charts Project Director, Gene Baker. Hello, Gene. Good afternoon, John. This How is. Are you uh, good? I, I'm I'm good. How are you? Getting ready for the holiday season. I was going to say this is going to be a um a, a nice end of year present for our users i hope <laughs> <laughs> i hope so give, it's, give yeah, it's hard really to believe yeah yeah it's really hard to believe that it's our last session of the year it seems like it's just flown by hasn't it it, it has definitely has yeah all right so let's let's j jump in all right before we get started just always you know remember today's session is for educational purposes only and decisions to buy sell hold or trade in securities commodities or other investments involves risk and best made with the advice of a qualified financial professional and that under no circumstances shall we be liable for any losses or damage you or anyone that occurs as a result of trading or investment activity that you or anyone else uh, engages in based on information or material that you receive through barchart.com and our services. Okay. So let's kind of re recap the genesis for this um, value investing strategy. It's popularized by Michael Higgins in 1991, and it based on the Dow, uh, Dow Jones Index and those stocks that have the highest dividend yield. And the basis is ba basically that these high dividend yielding stocks have fallen out of favor, and because of their large yield, uh, this creates a support and the belief that these stocks could serve as good candidates to outperform the broader market in that coming year. And kind of this sector rotation or rotations from growth to value stock. And we'll look at this a little bit in more in depth. Now, um, here's our main page. And so I just want to kind of, before we get started, before we jump in, I want to show you archived, under the tool section, archived webinars. If you go under the subject topics and trading ideas, about halfway down, you will find that webinar that we did back in January of 2021, ideas Stock ideas based on the Dow, dogs of the Dow. Okay. So what we did was we created this uh, hypothetical portfolio. And what we did was we did a dollar value weighted portfolio. In other words, what we did was we took $100,000 and we broke it up evenly between 10 stocks, $10,000. So we invested $10,000 in each one of these 10 stocks. And you can see that here. So let's see kind of how this portfolio has done for this year. So you can see that our total profit and loss of so far this year, we're up about $12,277.78. And that gives us a percentage uh, return of about 12.28%. And when we look at um, this portfolio, we look at the components of it. We can see the stocks that we used, uh, Chevron, IBM, Dow, uh, Walgreens, 3M, and so on, down to Verizon. You can see these are uh, those blue chip 
type stocks. So again, our portfolio was based on an equal weight in terms of dollar value, but you can see that because of the price of the different stocks, some stocks were, we were allowed to buy more shares of, and you can see that in our portfolio, we after we entered the data, you can see the quantities of how many shares we actually bought, the entry date. Now, we used the opening price on January 4th, and that was this price here. When we looked at our portfolio in terms of its diversification, one of the nice things that we discovered was that, yeah, we picked a lot of stocks based on the dividends, but when we looked at their sector weighting, you can see here in this uh, chart, this little pie chart here, besides IBM and Cisco that are in the same sector, we had a really evenly distributed uh, sector representation. Now, when we look at what is going on today in terms of bar chart opinion, now bar chart opinion isn't like an analyst giving an opinion. Bar chart opinion is based on a compilation of 13 technical indicators. And unfortunately today, uh, our dogs of the Dow, only three have a strong buy recommendation, excuse me, buy opinion, which just means that of the 13 indicators, they're all pointing to uh, the long side or to the buy. And most of the other ones in our portfolio, you can see uh, the ratio between those different um, technical analysis, which ones are uh, recommending a sell or signaling a sell signal or a buy signal. So unfortunately, the dogs of the Dow did in terms of technical analysis are still, most of them are still uh, dogs, so to speak. The other thing we can do is we can look at our performance of our individual um, stocks. And if we look at the year to date, for instance, we can see that even though the portfolio is only up 12%, we do have four stocks that were about 20, 25% or greater. We had two that were marginally uh, positive. We had two that were kind of marginally negative, maybe closer to unchanged. And then we had two that were really out uh, underperformed. But if we think about this in terms of a portfolio of 10 stocks, you know, I think we can uh, we can make an argument that, yeah, this portfolio, this is kind of normal what we're going to see when we um, do stock investing. We're not going to have all winners, right? We just want to make sure that our winners outpace our losers. So for a portfolio that had 40% of that portfolio is probably about 90% of the portfolio's performance and only two, 20% or two is on the underperformance, that's probably normal what we're going to see when we do kind of portfolio analysis. Now, when we had the webinar, we did create a uh, custom view for that webinar, and that one was called Dogs. And in that, we did look at some fundamental analysis in terms of which socks we picked, why we like them in terms of the, what we thought were cheap valuations. But the main reason was because we picked them because of their dividends. And you can see that even today, these dogs that from last year uh, are still yielding a large uh, percentage value. Typically what you will see is if a stock does perform well, its price rises, typically the yield does fall. Now we did see that um, in the case of Cisco, it, I think it was around three, three and a half percent. And Cisco now, the yield has fallen about 2.4 percent. So that's typical as well. But we can see that in terms of the portfolio, all of these stocks are still yielding a very high yield compared to what we might look at um, in other stocks. All right. So 
what else can we do? What else ways can we compare our portfolio, see if we did a good job? So one of the other things we did was we created a hypothetical portfolio based on just the Dow 30 uh, index. And this is the uh, Spiders ETF that represents the Dow 30, the diamond or the die. And, and you can see here that, again, we've invested 100000 in this. And year to date, from that time we entered that trade, uh, you can see that the Dow index is actually up. $18,000. So in terms of comparisons of our dogs versus the Dow, you can see that the dogs did underperform the Dow. But what is important for us to understand when we do these kind of comparative analysis, we want to make sure that we are uh, comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So if I go a little bit deeper into the Dow, and I look at its constituents, those stocks that represent that portfolio, this index, you'll notice that the top five from our United Health Group down to McDonald's, right, represent a large percentage of this index. As a matter of fact, if we look up here, we can see that in this ETF, the top 10 represent 50% of the portfolio. So this is this portfolio is actually weighted by price. If we look at the price of the stocks that are at the top of the list, the ones that have greater value in the portfolio, these are the more higher priced uh, Dow stocks. United Healthcare, Home Depot, Goldman Sachs, Microsoft. And each one of these also from left to right, you can see that they have performed well uh, during this year, that price has gone up. But if we look at the next five or the next 10 in the Dow, what we'll discover is that these five Yes, some of them have done decent, some have not, some have performed okay, and some have actually gone down. So what we see here is in the Dow index, the ETF, this weighted towards these five stocks is really what has created this outperformance. Just like in our portfolio, our four top stocks is really driving the performance of the portfolio. So it's hard to compare the two portfolios, one being a price weighted and one being equal dollar weighted. But another aspect of our value uh, and strategy was the reason why we picked um, these different stocks was because of the dividends. And so what I did was during the year, I took the dividends that our dogs were creating and created another portfolio. And um, what I did here was, uh, depending on the stock, right, I kind of try to make this a little bit easier on myself. For instance, if we look at year to date, it only says it's up, you know, $57. So our current value is maybe not 100% accurate. First of all, because of a rounding error as I'm getting the dividend in and then I'm purchasing, I'm doing a repurchase it, I'm going to do a dividend investment uh, process just to keep it in a portfolio. And so most companies, when they have their ex-dividend date, then they have a distribution date. And that's usually about three weeks afterwards. So what I did was I took the ex-dividend date and then I went on a weekly candle and just took the closing price of three weeks after the ex-dividend date. So that could have been three weeks or three weeks and a couple of days. Um, and not all stocks pay out three weeks. So that's why the uh, current value could be off, but the entry value is correct. This is the dollar value that I collected from the dogs of the Dow. 
and put into this portfolio. So if we look at that $4,621 and compared to our $100,000 portfolio, here we can see the dogs of the Dow uh, created a 4.6% dividend yield. So not too bad, right? In terms of what we wanted, that's why we picked these stocks. So um, again, if I go back to my Dow index and I look at the dividend yield, the dividend yield for the Dow index was only 1.6. So here, our dogs of the Dow in terms of dividends outperformed by about 3%. So that in terms of the total picture, does make our dogs of Dow a little bit um, um, better in terms of uh, its performance. All right. So I see a couple questions coming. I'll try to answer these questions as I go on. Yes, the 12% uh, reflects just the pure price, not the dividends. And we do have that dividend um, aspect that I just showed you too. Okay. So this is a buy and hold strategy. We were kind of committed to this strategy in the beginning of the year. We were gonna hold this portfolio through um, the whole year. And one of the things that we can do um, you know, I don't need to look at this portfolio every day. I didn't need to look at it every, every day. But one of the things that we can do is in my edit section of my portfolio, what I can do is I can send an email to myself based on either different times of days or at the end of the day. And that way I can take a look at this on my time, right? Because I'm not really concerned about this. I'm, I'm more of a longer term uh, investor. I just want to check into it uh, maybe once a week or once a month or so on. So this is a nice way for us uh, to get that information. And I can choose whatever uh, view that I want between main view or portfolio view. And I kind of like the portfolio view. So that's what I did. And in around March, what I started noticing is that the dogs were consistently outperforming the Dow, the, the, the Dow index. And so at that point, what I wanted to do was I wanted to go back into our portfolio and just go and look at some of the stocks and see if there was, you know, some things that I can do or just kind of just kind of get a feel of how this portfolio was doing in these individual stocks. So one of the things that we can do in our portfolios, we can create notes and we can tell ourselves, we can give ourselves these little notes based on what our stocks are doing. For instance, uh, in Chevron here, I put a note here that I had two targets. My stock was performing. I had two targets, 910, 10, and 1550. And these were pre-COVID levels. Um, in IBM, around, I think it was around March or so, uh, we did a um, technical analysis and IBM was one of the ones that we looked at. And one of the things that we discovered was one of the technical analysis, I think it was Andrew's Pitchfork, uh, was projecting that IBM was going to peak sometime in around May. So I wrote sell in May, go away, but also some values. Now I'm not starting looking at support and resistance values. Um, for instance, under uh, 3M, have a target and then also some swing supports where I believe the market is holding value. And for instance, in Verizon, here we had, I made a note that was something was not right about Verizon and that below $58, I need to make a decision on this particular stock. And what also is nice about these notes is we can go in and set what are called low and high flags. Now, low and high flags, again, could be values of targets. It could be values of support, could be values 
of resistance and that when our stock price gets above or below, above the high or below the low, then it will signal to us in our portfolio. It doesn't send you a signal uh, through an email, it just signals it here. So you can see here that our cog is green. That's telling us that this stock, my high flag was 1260, and the stock right now, Chevron, is trading 1652. So it's above my high flag, and therefore the a high fly signal that green and that's also why we have a green line under the symbol of Chevron if I look at IBM notice that the low flag was activated 140.39 and IBM right now is trading 129.44 so a lot of these high and low flags that I created was back in March now I did also come back uh, later in the year and adjusted some of them but we'll look at a couple of them in a second. So this is a nice way also to keep on top of your portfolio. So this buy and hold strategy, right? Yeah, we kind of want to wait for We kind of wait for price to move in. And again, I said to you about March, I started recognizing that some of these stocks were doing really well. And at some point, a buy and hold strategy needs some kind of risk management. Now, what we don't want is to buy and let our stocks become profitable and then hold them until they become a loss. That's not good trading management. So one of the, one of the easiest technical analysis that we can use is trend lines. It's one of the oldest and longest technical analysis. It's very simple to do. Now, here's my chart of Exxon, excuse me, uh, Chevron. And let me just sh tell you the components of what's going on in this chart. First of all, when we look at the next couple charts, all the charts, the vertical blue line represents our entry date. The horizontal blue line represents our entry value. And you can see that about beginning of February, Exxon, excuse me, <laughs> Chevron uh, had a nice up trend now the other horizontal lines that i've shown here some of them might be support or resistance levels and others could be potential targets in the case of chevron these two upper ones were potential targets this 109.10 an area of supply from pre-covid and the 1550 again areas where i believe that price could rise to but might run into a potential uh, new sellers or sellers that have been waiting patiently let's go back to a year so again trend line so what did Chevron do? Well, it made that first target, that 109.10, and it got up to, but did not get to the second target. And you can see our nice little trend line here. And then price did what? Price broke our trend line at the same point where we had a previous area of resistance, where price paused, and then we broke through. So this is kind of a pivot point and so if i was managing this in my portfolio this might be an opportunity for me to exit this trade let's look at this trade at this point by march chevron was up 32 percent that's a good return on a stock in just you know three or four months now again we want to let our profits run that's part of trading but also we want to cut losses and could that trend line break be an indication that Chevron is about to go lower? And in trend line analysis, very steep trend lines tend to break or have a failure rate that when they do break, price does move dramatically. But if I like Chevron to be an opportunity to buy again, maybe I will wait for price to either get back above, show me a breakout, or in this case, what we can see later in the year, there was a downtrend, and then we had a breakout 
above that downtrend that could have let us given us clues to get back into Chevron. So that's like kind of a simple um, risk management technique. But let me talk to you guys about um, another one. And when I was in college, I had a, took an investment class with an, a, a, a very uh, distinguished professor. Now this gentleman was in his late 70s at the time, and he was born around 1910. And he actually was a runner on the stock exchange back in uh, the crash of 1929. And he worked at all the major brokerage houses on Wall Street. Uh, he claimed that uh, one of his friends he was uh, friends with was E.F. Hutton and that he knew Robert Ray, who, which was the editor at the time um, of the Wall Street Journal and also was the author of the book um, Dow Theory. Now, his style was a buy and hold style, similar to our dogs, the Dow. And he believed in only three technical analysis, right? One was the advanced decline. He just looked at stocks that were going up and down in terms of giving them a sentiment to the market. He used trend lines or trend line breaks, which I just showed you with the Chevron. And the other rule that he used was a 20-day moving average, 4.5% rule. Now, what that was, if price fell, well, wait, excuse me, if price closed below the 4.5% of his 20-day moving average, he would stop himself out of that stock. Now, as I grew as a trader in experience and knowledge, I was really taken by how simple and pathetic, pathetic this rule was. Now, if you think about a stock that moves around on a day-to-day -day basis, most stocks move about one, a half to one and a half percent, maybe two percent on uh, an average day. So think about that. If price moves 4.5%, then we're probably down three days in a row or a three-day movement, and that might be a signal of change of trend. But a moving average is a lagging indicator, and a lagging indicator says that it follows price. And so a positive moving average means that price has been above the moving average. And then for it to get below the moving average, it had to fall from above to below. And that might have been 5 or 10% above to 4.5% below. Again, another signal in modern times, you know, 10% correction or 15% correction, it could be an, a sign that you want to be out of that trade. And then also what's nice about this system is it helps eliminate those one-day anomalies. You know, those days when we do see 3% or 5% price movements, right, or it's two standard deviation. Many times a market will fall below one of these moving averages or these trend lines and have a big price interday price movement that could fall four or five percent, but it doesn't settle below four and a half percent. And so this simple rule that I learned from this, I've used in my, my trading and I've served me very well. So here's JP Morgan Chase, and I just want to go back to my notes here. Let me see if I still have it up here. Um, hang on a second. And my notes on that was there was a trend line break at 146 and a half, and there's an evening start 156.75. And remember, around March, I said I started looking at all these stocks and there's that evening star this is a very bearish candlestick formation and that 146.50 was an area of support whereas price had trending higher it came down held and then uh, went higher so the the two lines were the ones that i just mentioned you in my portfolio now you can see that let's do this let's add a moving average. We're going to add a 20 day and a 100 day moving average. And the 20 day is the green line here. And you can see that we did fall below our 20 day moving average. But we didn't close below 4.5%. 
We went below 4.5% on a daily basis, intraday basis. But also, now what is going on here is that we're holding this support. This 146.50 now becomes a very significant point, and then price moves away. Well, now we have this trend line, right? We have another area of support that we can add to our trend line. But then price does fall again, and it breaks below my 20-day moving average. And here it is, 4.5%. But what does price do at this point? Not only does it fall 4.5% from my moving average, but it breaks my trend line. And it falls back through an area of resistance that became an area of support. So, gosh, this very simple rule found the same spot that the market turned. An area of support, a trend line, and a percentage movement. So this is a really nice uh, technical analysis. So let's go to um, IBM. IBM, if you remember in our portfolio, is one of those stocks that only did a marginally well through this whole year process. But again, if we look at this in terms of targeting for profits, looking to manage this on a risk performance basis, right? Here's our 20-day moving average. And you can see that at one point we did get above 150. Now, what was 150? What did that mean to us? Well, 150 just happened to be a major area of resistance that went back to about the pre-COVID days. So at that point, if we got up to target of 150, could that be an opportunity for me to exit this trade and take my profits? Yeah, at that point, IBM was up 21%. But again, you know, we want to kind of let profits run, right? So do we have a trend line? Yeah, we do. Do we have a 20-day moving average? Yeah, we do. And we can see that price now is below, broke through our trend line, not only broke through our trend line, but then we did get that 4.5% movement. And that 4.5% movement was below our trend line and below our 20-day moving average. But again, notice that that broke an area of support. And that would have been a signal for us to ring the register on this one because probably uh, IBM is going to go to, whoa, now you can see that we did float around that support line back and forth for a long period of time. But then again, once it got back below it for the third time, uh, it really fell out. And in this case, we probably would have stopped ourselves out for a profit of about 13.8%, right? A little bit better than I think the 5% that um, IBM would have finished today. But it's not all about profits. It's also about losers. So it's important for us to also be honest with ourselves. Make sure that if we have a part of our portfolio that is not performing well, you know, don't get married to it and feel like that you have to hold on to that trade. So again, here is Verizon and our blue horizontal line is our entry value. And you can see that right out of the box, Verizon was underperforming. And um, but like I said, didn't really look at Verizon. I didn't really look at a lot of these stocks until about March. And it, at that point, Verizon did start making a nice trend up, made a nice little trend line. And it got back up to that entry value, right? It already appreciated about 10% from its yearly low that it made back in February. But it was not performing like the other dogs. So what could I do? Well, you know, I looked at this $58 where I said that $58 might be an area of decision for me. Is this stock one of those stocks that's not performing and I want to just cut my losses? And you can see that here was a rally-based rally that got us above our entry level and then price broke it. And price came back a couple times and held it. But at this point, now I'm saying to myself, well, how long do I want to hold on to this stock? When do I want to make that decision that this stock is not performing? And again, we could have used that 4% rule based on our trend lines or our moving averages. But in this case, what I thought was, 
why don't I wait and hold on to the stock until the benefit of the dividend that I'm going to receive this year becomes negative? In other words, if I'm getting 4.5% return on a dividend and my stock falls 20%, you know, that I'm going to be losing money on that position. So I gave Verizon the benefit of the doubt, and that 4.5% dividend from that entry value put us right around $56, $56.20. And notice that it's kind of ironic that we did bounce off of that level several times before eventually breaking through and then continuing lower. So here was one of those stocks that underperformed, right? Uh, I think Verizon is down about 10% from our initial uh, investment. But here we could have stopped ourselves out for maybe only about a 5% uh, loss. Now, it would have increased the performance of our portfolio by much, maybe about a half a percent. But still, this is good risk management technique. Now, before I move away from uh, this example, I do want to point out this little um, oval here, this um, lavender oval. And those of you who have been faithful and watched a lot of our segments, we did a, we did a series on candlesticks back in the middle of, uh, I think it was around September-ish. And we talked about uh, unique candlestick patterns. And this is a unique candlestick pattern. This is called a three candle crash or a three candle can uh, down market. And usually you see these at the end of a much longer downtrend. And you can see we had been in a nice downtrend. And usually at the end of that downtrend, not always, but usually. And it's usually at an area of significance. And you can see that uh, we were at an area of very significant support based on previously in the year. And really what has happened is anybody who was long here in Verizon probably got stopped out. And we saw a massive uh, influx of sell orders and this kind of this capitulation to the market. So this is not – this candlestick pattern is not a selling signal because we're going to have to wait for the pattern to be developed. This is actually a buying opportunity. Now – we go through the rules in video about the rules of a three candle drop and we wait for this green candle and in this particular trade the risk of this trade was about 50 cents that it ended up getting our third target which was about five to one or about two dollars and fifty cents so I just wanted to point this out to you for those of you who are candlestick traders or like different kind of candlestick patterns. This is a very unique one. It usually comes at the end of a downtrend. Uh, this is a sign of a capitulation, but it's also a buying opportunity. And this one did work out really nice, even though Verizon didn't, after uh, failing to get back above that support line, went back down again. All right, so that's kind of just some risk management techniques. So the other thing I wanted to do was look at our performance of our portfolio from a little bit of a different perspective. So let's go back to our Dow and I'm going to go to a chart and I'm going to make this chart a little bit better for presentation purposes. And again, there's our blue line that represents our entry date. And you can see that, again, from about through March, the Dow was outperforming and or performing well. And then about mid-May to about June, we started seeing prices start to fall. So, yeah, around late mid-May to late June, I started noticing that our portfolio – our dogs to Dow portfolio was starting to have down days, or it was starting to have these swings where it was up one percent one day and down one and a half or two percent the next day, right? Kind of telling me the market is in a sideways action. So I kind of wanted to see if our dogs of the Dow, in essence, the Dow, how it was performing versus other indexes or other ETFs. So I'll put in the SPY, I'll put in the Qs, whoops, and I'll put in the Russell. 
Now, one of the things I want to kind of mention here for you is a little technique tip here. If I'm going to do a comparison on multiple assets, and those assets have a wide range of price, for instance, the Russell's around $200, and yet the S&P is around $400. When I do a price comparison, it's a little bit difficult to really see anything when I do that relative strength comparison. So one of the tips that I'm going to give you is change your price scale to a percentage scale. And this will now change the price movements in terms of how much they move on a percentage basis. And it'll be a lot easier to do that comparative analysis. And what we can see here is a lot easier to distinguish between them now. And you can see that the Russell did outperform through the first part of the year. Here's our black line, that's our Dow. Dow had our dogs. And our dogs, contained our dogs, our dogs were outperforming the S&P and the NASDAQ, the Qs. S&P has a combination of value and growth stocks. The uh, Qs are more growth or techn technology uh, heavy uh, stocks, ETF. So our portfolio was outperforming up until about June. And then something happened. What happened? Well, if you remember history, in June we had the Delta variant and a lot of the fears that we we're going to go into lockdown, and stocks that were would be in, let's say, the Russell, you know, reopening stocks, uh, uh, cruises, airlines. Um, those stocks started to underperform, and the fact that the Fed said that they weren't going to uh, start tapering yet and that they were still going to do quantitative easing, that was beneficial for uh, our growth stocks. And you can see that from June on, uh, the S&P and the NASDAQ has outperformed the Dow and the Russell. Now, does that mean that going forward, could we see a shift again? Yeah, maybe it could. Does it mean that those sectors that have been leading for the last six months could outperform the next six months? Yeah, maybe they might. But I wanted to do a little bit deeper comparison. So what I did was instead of looking at the indexes themselves, what I did was I looked at the sectors. And so what I do here is I have the S&P value sector and I picked violet for value so when we do this and the XMP growth sector which I picked G green growth and again I'm using a percentage scale and you can see that in the S&P itself right the value stocks did outperform the growth stocks through June so our dogs of the Dow did do its job. They were outperforming up until that point. And then things happen. Things change, right? Why it's important for us to have good risk management. And from the point of June, right, our value stocks in the Dow have kind of been stuck in the mud. And the uh, growth stocks have outperformed. All right. So when we did our webinar back in January, we looked at what possible trends could play out in this coming year, in 2021. So we talked about COVID related and this return to the new normal. And so what stocks caught that tailwind? Well, Chevron, caught that tailwind because energy stocks had underperformed in 2020. We'll look at that in a moment. But Coca-Cola, right, people start going out to restaurants again, uh, it's going to sporting events, um, going to theaters, concerts. So those two stocks did perform based on that trend. Uh, implementation of the uh, acceptance and I adaptations of the 5G. Well, we thought Verizon might do well. Well, we saw that Verizon did not. Uh, expansion of healthcare. 
Walgreens was one of the ones that we talked about in the video. And Walgreens did do uh, well this year. Uh, Merck, on the other hand, was a roller coaster. It was down, it was up, it was down, it was up, it was up. It was all over the place. Um, so it didn't it perform as well. Uh, continued growth from this work home technology, work from home technology. Well, Cisco and IBM were definitely ones that caught that tailwind. Cisco is still uh, doing well based on that tailwind. We did see in the example of IBM, it caught that tailwind until about June, and then things changed for IBM. A government spending from the new administration. Well, that didn't happen. That trend did not come true because of delays in implementation of their uh, their policies. But those two stocks that we picked, the Dow and 3M, those were the two that were unchanged for the year. So they really didn't catch any tailwinds. And then this diminishing returns of fixed investments, right? Bonds or treasury notes, right? The low yields that we've had for a long period of time, investors are looking for chasing higher yields. And so some of the stocks that of the three that we picked that had the highest yields, Chevron and Dow and Visa, again, we got mixed results. Chevron did outperform, still paying out a nice dividend. Dow didn't do much of anything, still paying a nice dividend. And Verizon went down, but still paying that uh, nice dividend. All right, so that's kind of the trends we were looking at, but also what we're talking about here in what we can think about for next year is market rotation, right? That how certain sectors will lead the broader market. And then when their valuations get too expensive based on either their book value, their earnings, or their sales, um, or where they are in their business cycle, you know, investors will rotate money in and out of these higher performing stocks and look for value in stocks that maybe have not performed, all right, or that could start to perform in the next business cycle. And this balance between growth and value. And that's really kind of what our dog of the Dow was. But for next year, and this is going to be our tease going forward, is what trends can we look for, but also Maybe we might look at business cycles and see if there aren't certain sectors that perform in certain business cycles. Now, this is a snapshot of our webinar back in January, and I want you to notice two things. First of all, this is a year's composite. So this is showing us the performance of the S&P sectors from 2020 to the end of 2020 before um, January 6th. And notice the two best performing sectors, uh, information technology and consumer discretionaries, both of them up over 30%. They're almost 35%. And notice the two that are at the bottom of the heap, right? This is as we came through COVID. Real estate and energy were the bottom form. So was there value in those stocks? maybe for this coming year. That's was kind of our thesis. And if we go to today, I'm in stocks, stock market sectors, and I look at performance year to date. Notice which sectors are at the top of the heap, the ones that were at the bottom of the heap last year. Energy, real estate, those are the ones. Now, our technology and our consumer discretionaries did have a good year. We saw that on the chart and that comparison, those ones, those gross type stocks, those ones did finish out the year pretty strong. But let's look at the underperformers for this past year. And at the bottom of our deck here is consumer staples and utilities. Now their returns are kind of similar to the returns of our dogs of the Dow. And you know they did perform, they did weren't underperformance like we saw in the energy and the uh, real estate from the previous year. 
but uh, they they're certainly underperformed. So could those be stocks or values of stocks that we could look for going into the new year? So let's look what has happened in the last month. And in the last month, real estate and consumer staples and utilities are one of the better sectors that have been performing. Which ones have underperformed? The ones that were performing very well over the last year, consumer discretionaries. And up until the rally yesterday and the big rally we had in the market, information technology was at the bottom of the list. They made a big movement in just one day. So healthcare, real estate, consumer, staples, utilities are the ones that are starting to outperform in the last month, which brings me back full circle to this tease that I'm going to do for you guys. Now, I wanted to go in to talk about some trends for this year. I know that that's what we talked about in our description for the webinar, but there's, uh, I'm going to run out of time. I want to really do a really in-depth job for you guys. So what we're going to do is we're going to come back in January and we're going to look at this business cycle idea to find potential trading ideas for next year. And we'll look at other pages on uh, bar chart to help us find some good trading opportunities, not just a particular strategy like we did with the dogs of the Dow. So we'll do that in the beginning of the year um, in January. But I just want to talk to you about this business cycle. And this is a kind of the tease what I wanted to do, give you a little food for thought over the holidays. First, you know, notice that in the late cycle, first of all, that all sectors tend to perform in different different portions or phases of our business cycle. Now, in the late cycle, when economic activity surges or peaks, but corporations warn of headwinds and slowing growth, which has certainly been the headlines uh, we've been hearing over the last few weeks, the sectors that do well are energies and utilities. Those are the two sectors that have outperformed. And in recessionary times, when economic activity contracts and profits decline and credit costs rise, certainly an indication from what we read from what's going on with the Fed raising rates next year. But inflation is definitely having an impact on a lot of our corporations, wage inflations and input inflation. And what sectors do well during this potential recessionary period of the business cycle, consumer staples, healthcare, and high dividend yielding stocks. Those sectors that have been performing in the last month. So what is the market telling us? Could it be giving us clues of what the market is thinking over the next year? Remember, the market is always forward looking. Some folks think it's 12 months. Some folks think it's 18 months. So maybe some of the opportunities we're going to be looking for will be in this recessionary cycle. But when it comes out of recession, the early stages of new business cycle. So maybe we'll wait for value, look for some value in some of our real estate, financials, and consumer discretionaries sometime next year uh, as a trading opportunity. All right, so I do see a couple of questions. If I didn't answer, I try to answer them as I went through. Um, if you have a question, please uh, send them to support at barchart.com. And if our support team can't answer those questions, uh, they'll send them along to me. And I promise that you get your questions answered. So um, be interactive that way. One of the other things uh, I want to also remind you folks is that you can have uh, a free membership. Those of those who are first timers in here, a basic free membership. But there is also a way for you to try some of our premium pages, some of our premium tools. And one of the nice premium features we have is I can have as unlimited portfolios and watch lists, right? And I can get those emails sent to me at different times of the day. So that is a benefit of Premier. So you can try the Premier membership for 
uh, 30 days for free. So I recommend that you try doing that. Okay. Well, Gene, that kind of sums it up, right? Yes, it does, John. Um, we're not going to have a session next week because it's the holidays. We will come back in the beginning of the year. And so I mentioned in the opening, this is our last uh, session together. Yeah. Now, and John, do you realize how many sessions it's been this year that you've put on for our uh, bar chart listeners? Let me think. Let's see. Well, there's 52 weeks. I probably had a, maybe about four or five weeks where I took some time off. So I'm going to guess maybe 42. Wow. You're almost right on. It's 40. This is the 43rd session that you've done this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, right? Yes, it is. And uh, and through it all, I mean, I'm I'm really hoping, and I think you share my sentiment as well, that uh, our bar chart users have found these sessions to be helpful. I know I've learned a lot from you and um, we're looking forward to another year full of education from you. Well, um, I appreciate that. And first and foremost, I want to reiterate what you said. I want to thank our subscribers and our viewers. And without your support and your feedback, uh, this would not happen. And I encourage all you to keep in touch and send suggestions, keep them coming. And if you want a topic or a subject matter that you want us to explore next year, send them along to support at dot com. Support bar chart at dot com. Um, second, I want to thank um, those individuals that are behind the scenes that help support Gene and I's effort to bring this for you guys, uh, Andrew, Colleen, Brandon, Isaac, Thomas, those just to name a few of the folks that help us out. And finally, and most importantly, thank you goes to Gene for your help, Gene, your input, your guidance, and your patience <laughs> working with me. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, John, and the pleasure's been mine. And, uh, Thank you. Thanks for, for providing this top-notch education to our site users. So with that, on the behalf of Gene and myself and the Bar Chart family, I want to wish you all a happy holidays, a happy new year, and the good of all trading. See you next year.